This time we're going to talk on the world's economy, but not only, with Mr. Richard Vedder, a professor at Ohio State University. Good morning, sir. Glad to be with you, Sebastian. The first question, are you already vaccinated? No, I'm not. Uh, like uh, many people, including those in Poland, our vaccination is going very slowly and I am supposed to get in line to be vaccinated uh, as early as today, but uh, who knows when, uh, soon, hopefully. I ask this question not without a reason. Uh, there's been a huge government financial involvement in the process of discovering vaccine. Almost every producer used this kind of financing to some degree. So without the government, would we not have come up with a vaccine at such an amazing pace? Did government really help this time? Well, I think uh, that we tend to overestimate the importance of government in this. Why did they go to a private enterprise? Because they couldn't do it themselves. The, the bureaucracy, uh, all of the delays that would uh, inevitably happen, and the pharmaceutical companies, the uh, private enterprise was able to work day and night and uh, do all sorts of special things, uh, have incentives to get it done. So uh, yeah, the government uh, support w was useful, uh, helpful. Uh, and uh, would it have happened if the government had not been involved? I think it would have. Uh, this is, you know, I tend to be a conservative, even a libertarian uh, by my own political background, but there is a case for some government involvement in vaccines because vaccines do have what we call in economics, positive externalities or spillover effects. If it's Sebastian, if you get vaccinated, other members of your family or friends or coworkers of yours, get some element of protection too. They're happy that you're vaccinated because it helps them. And there, when those situations exist, there is a case for government involvement. So are there many other cases for government involvement beside that one? There are very few. Uh, I think we tend to overstate uh, this uh, 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 kind of thing. I, I once had a discussion with a very great economist and libertarian Milton Friedman uh, about this. And Friedman once believed that education should be uh, provided by government for everyone, uh, even higher education, universities. Uh, but towards the end of his life, I asked him about that and he said, no, I think there are some negative spillover effects to universities government funding of universities, and maybe we ought to tax universities rather than uh, uh, subsidize them. Mm -hmm. So that may apply in a lot of other areas as well. Well, all this is a b part of a bigger problem of government spending. Now the world sees a huge increases uh, in indebtedness, in public yeah. indebtedness especially. Uh, is it something to be afraid of? What do you think? I think so. Uh, the most economists in my country and in, uh, uh, in the Western world uh, uh, and throughout the world are not too worried about this. In fact, many have advocated more indebtedness to get us out of the problems. I think we're looking at a s potential very severe long-term problem. Uh, we are... Uh, uh, I say in the United States, we're dropping dollars out of airplanes uh, over people, hoping that somehow that will stimulate the economy. But we're borrowing enormous amounts of money, which have to be uh, dealt with in some capacity. If we re renounce this debt, then our uh, reputation as a nation is goes way down. The dollar, in our case, the dollar loses its uh, 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 value as a world currency, uh, etc. Uh, so we have to deal with this. And the politicians, I always say that politicians are like uh, teenage boys 
uh, who are like girls and you don't want to let them, you want to put limits on their uh, interaction with girls uh, or you will have big problems. And I think you have to do the same thing with politicians. You have to put some limits on their uh, uh, behavior. Uh, and there are legal, legal uh, ways to do this. You can have in your constitution, make it illegal to borrow money. I mean, you could do that, the uh, government, or make it very difficult. And uh, we probably need to have more of these limits put on the politician's ability to go out and borrow money uh, Zelatis, dollars, pounds, it doesn't matter what the currency uh, throughout the world, we need more limits. So do you think that those legal, say, breaks can really be effective in limiting politicians' activity in terms of going more into debt? I mean, uh, you know, when you look at the world right now in pandemic, then you can see that politicians actually do not care for those um, bills we call constitutions, uh, they lock people down uh, without, uh, you know, making sure that it's all legal. They think uh, that it's justified because they say the circumstances are exceptional. So uh, do you think that that will be enough? Just, you know. Uh, oh, I, I agree with you. I mean, this is a serious problem. The politician will always grab for more power in any kind of government, democratic government, uh, authoritarian government, a uh, government like Poland had 50 years ago in the communist era, uh, in any government, the politicians will always grab for more power, uh, just as Putin is grabbing for power in Russia uh, now. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, this is, and by the way, I uh, drank vodka with Putin in the Kremlin once, and I have a picture on the wall to prove it, but I will, I'll save that for another day. Uh, uh, so uh, the politicians always grab for power. They always want more power. They're, you try to put limits on their power. And you do it in writing, in uh, laws, in constitutions, and you hope that the rule of law will work. If the politicians decide to violate the rule of law, what can you do about it? Well, uh, you have to have a public that absolutely will not tolerate this. And you have to have institutions that are respected by the, the, the population. Uh, we have problems with that. When you, when you say about politicians, that they uh, actually, when they want, they can do whatever they uh, they please. Uh, there's something interesting, some interesting uh, issue at work here because uh, many of those politicians they have, let's say, liberal um, approach to economy, and they have the understanding of how the world works, and even so they decide sometimes to break those rules, to go against it, like now with all those lockdowns, with all those spending and so on. Um, so is there something, do you think, is there something corruptive about power, like Lord Acton said? No, I, I think you're right. Uh, Act, Lord Acton was brilliant when, when he said power corrupts. Uh, uh, he was absolutely right. And you can pass laws and you can pass, uh, make it, uh, do all sorts of things in writing to try to restrict that. But the politicians will look for excuses. Uh, and the pandemic is an excuse. Uh, okay, we have a public health emergency. As if they somehow have superior knowledge about how to deal with it, by the way. Uh, who knows? Uh, does the president of uh, Poland or the president of the United States know anything about public health any more than you do or me or uh, medical doctors? No, but they nonetheless impose the restrictions because they can, they enjoy the power. Uh, we try to uh, deal with this, we pass laws, we pass constitutional uh, restrictions, hope that they work. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. 
Uh, do you think that there is the danger that taxes will go uh, up uh, in the future uh, because you know somebody is gonna uh, to pay all those debts? Yeah, absolutely. In the United States, there's a great book written of uh, 30, 40 years ago by a uh, a friend of mine, Robert Higgs. He wrote a book called Crisis and Leviathan, and what it says is, when there's ever a crisis, war depression, whatever, the government says, we got to raise taxes to help deal with the problem. But then the taxes never go down. I mean, fully. They go up, but they only come down maybe part way. So government gets ever bigger. It always gets bigger because there's a crisis and that somehow government can deal with this. And Higgs argues that's the problem. Uh, when there's a war and we get over the war, we still keep uh, a lot of the expending uh, going uh, and uh, what have you. Uh, and the same with depressions and so on. And I think that's true. Not only this was true for the United States, but I think it's very true. Certainly was true uh, in Western Europe. I, I, I'm convinced uh, the Western European nations uh, are taxed their people today, typically 40, 45, 50% of the people's incomes. Uh, uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, 1950, they taxed them 20% uh, of their income or 25. The taxes have gone way, way up all over Europe. Uh, uh, you know, some countries more than others, uh, but they've gone way up. And uh, that is uh, the impact of the welfare state. And, uh, uh, and uh, I think it's, it has slowed economic growth down uh, in Western Europe from 5% a year in the 1950s, in the 1960s, to 3% a year in the 1970s, and 2% a year in the 1990s, and now maybe 1% now, except for Poland and uh, some Eastern European countries who are smarter because they have a more recent experience with the communist era, and they know uh, the uh, debilitating the negative effects of massive government intervention more better. They have a better understanding. Do you think that under Joe Biden, you will have some instant tax increases this year? He, he, Biden wants big tax increases this year, uh, but he's gonna have difficulty because he, his control over the government is pretty limited right now because the, uh, we have a, a Congress, a legislative branch of government uh, that uh, he has partial control of the, our House of Representatives, but our Senate is 50, literally 50-50, 50, 50, 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans. So his control there is very, very limited. So if, if one Democrat, just one Democrat says, no, I'm not gonna go along with a tax increase, he can't get it. So my guess is he will get some small tax increases. He'll get some tax increases, but nothing like what he wants. Actually, when politicians say that they want to increase taxes, they say that's because they want to finance all those government programs that created additional debts. But you with uh, Stephen Moore some years ago uh, published an article in which you claim that every dollar, every additional dollar in taxes creates more than a dollar in spending. It's kind of a vicious circle, never ending. Well, I, I look at it as an economist, I look at it this way. The politicians really are mainly trying to increase their own welfare, their own happiness. If they can increase that of the population, that's good. But the main thing is they want to maximize their own satisfaction. That's you know, not that's the human emotion. Uh, you and I are probably trying to do the same thing. So the issue is, if an increase in uh, 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 taxes lowers the possibility of getting reelected, of keeping an office, yeah, the way you bribe, the way you solve that problem is you keep you spending more. So you spend more, and you give the public whatever they want. They want new schools, buildings, they want uh, uh, a better water supply, they want whatever, uh, uh, environmental projects. You, we give them whatever that makes them happy. 
And in order to do that, since government's so inefficient, inefficient, you have to spend maybe two dollars or a dollar and a half uh, to win enough su support to offset the dollar and costs from the taxes. So uh, it's a never ending uh, business and uh, the debts never get smaller or I, it rarely get smaller. Uh, they tend to get larger and uh, that's been going on. It's gone on in Europe. Uh, the EU, you know, put this 60% rule, all these rules on and they're being broken most of the time these days. Uh, the, the, the Italians could, there's no way the Italians are ever going to pay any attention to these rules. That's just not in the Italian temperament or the Greek temperament or the Spanish temperament. Uh, it's not going to happen. Actually, when you look like globally at all those 12, 200 years of capitalism, uh, then the trend is only to increase debts. Even if there were some reversals, they were only partial and periodical. Like for example, during Thatcher or Reagan era, you know, some people who are uh, hostile towards capitalism say that we had some kind of a great deregulation during the 80s. Actually, it's not true. We had only a slowdown in the pace of uh, uh, right. getting bigger. So uh, actually the data is there to support pessimism in terms of uh, the... Oh, yes. I completely agree. Just look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. Even under Reagan, even under Thatcher. I love Thatcher. I've met that. I have a picture on my wall with me with Thatcher too, and uh, uh, who I love. I'm reading a massive biography of Thatcher right now. Uh, uh, but even under Thatcher, uh, debts tended to go up rather than down more. Uh, under Reagan, they certainly did. Of course, he was also dealing with Gorbachev and the, the Soviet leaders and the Cold yeah. War and all of that sort of thing, which added some to the cost. But uh, he, he, Reagan ran up quite a, a large amount of debt, actually. In the 19th century, people had some, their, uh, what one distinguished economist called there was a fiscal constitution. People felt a moral obligation to reduce debt. They felt it was like immoral. It was like uh, um, committing murder or something to go into deep into debt. And so uh, the, once in the United States, we came within $50,000 of eliminating our debt, almost completely in the, the 1840s. But in the 20th century, after John Maynard Keynes, especially in the 1930s, no, not, never anymore. And uh, you're, you're basically right. Uh, his, in the modern history of the world, that is certainly the case. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, many, many of the free market uh, economists um, that I recently uh, spoke with, they are complaining at the American universities that they are suppressing free speech, free speech, especially if it is a right-wing or free market speech. So according to your opinion, is it really the case? There is, lamentably, there's a lot of truth to that, yes. America does have several thousand universities and unlike in Europe, where there's usually a ministry of education that controls all the universities <laughs> in a country. In America, we have 50 states, as we call them, and uh, we have lots of private universities. So it does vary some from school to school. But as a generalization, I think you're correct. I'm very, very worried about suppression of ideas. I uh, recently, <laughs> the cancel culture, as we call it, came to me recently. I uh, wrote an article for uh, a major American magazine, I will not name it, and they said, no, you, we don't like that because, you know, it might offend someone or, you know, it, we, we just think that, that that's too provocative, you shouldn't say that. And I've never had that problem much before. It's starting to come to me and it, my colleagues, and uh, it's frightening. 
uh, because if you can't have free expression of ideas, you don't have a vibrant democracy. Uh, that's what, uh, you know, your country fought all, that's what they fought about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, to have the right to express oneself. And the universities of all places, the one place where you ought to, anyone ought to be able to say anything, uh, uh, dress any way they want, uh, wear rings in their noses and long hair like you have, Sebastian. Uh, uh, and anywhere where that should happen to the universities, that's where young people should be able to express themselves. And we are suppressing that too much. I'm very concerned about it. Do you think that this phenomenon have a big impact on the society as a whole? Or maybe the domination of left-wing views is as a result of changes in the society itself? What's the causal relation here? I think the universities and the uh, schools uh, over the long run have led to a deterioration, a decline in free expression, uh, in free markets, uh, toleration of free markets, in excessive government intervention, because uh, that is the bias of the universities. And uh, I think in time, it becomes uh, people, uh, uh, it becomes their bias. It be we teach this to our children and then 25 years later, our children are running the country and they do this, you know, this, it continues, it gets worse. I have this uh, homemade theory that leftist bias in universities is partly responsible for hate speech censorship in social media. They're mostly run by people who have higher education by now, and they transmit those biases into the business. I, I guess it was not so, at least to such a deg degree, in the first decades after the war. What do you think? <laughs> I think you're, you're right. You look at uh, all of this the people, who are the people who are doing the suppression? They're very bright people. They're about, some of them have a doctor, uh, philosophy degrees, PhDs, as we call them in the US. They're very, very bright people. Uh, and uh, they say, we are the wise people. We are the chosen people. We are the philosopher kings, to use Plato's term. And we should be, regulate society and decide what's good and what is bad. And that attitude, I think, comes out of the universities. And I think it shows up in the social media companies. And that is a big problem now, what to do about the suppression of free speech by social media. Uh, uh, and I don't have an easy answer. The best thing is more competition, a new, new entrance into the field. If Twitter refuses to uh, uh, put all of, Donald Trump says a lot of crazy things and uh, I, I agree with Twitter that they're, most of them are crazy, but should he be allowed to say them? Sure he should be allowed to say them. That's what a democracy is all about. That's what free society is all about. We let anyone say anything within reason that, uh, that, that they want. So, so you are not in the camp of supporters of new regulation because, for example, here in Poland, we have a kind of a split between free market people. Part of them are saying, well, you know, you know, it's, it's not good that they are suppressing those people. They should let them talk, even if they talk stupid things, uh, but they should let them anyway. But well, it's free market. What can you do? It's private property of Mark Zuckerberg or people from Google or from Amazon. Uh, on the other hand, we have those free market people who say, well, there is some limited uh, space for state to intervene. And this is one of those cases where a state should regulate, should yeah. you know, enforce some kind of uh, uh, fair treatment for all the uh, participants in public discourse. I understand both sides of that argument and I'm not sure where I come down. I am undecided. The one hand I say uh, we should uh, Twitter and uh, Google and uh, Amazon, all these people uh, should not try to control the lives of others and put limits on and we, sh uh, we should 
the government should uh, enforce that. Uh, on the other hand, I don't. Whenever the government gets involved, they manage to make a mess of things, and make it usually worse than it was to begin with. And so that means I take the other view. So I am. It's I haven't made up my own mind yet on this, Sebastian. Uh, most most professors have think they have the answers to everything. Yeah. I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. Professors very often do not like to admit they do not know something. They know. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes. Thank I've, you very much for your time, Professor. Uh, I've had, I've enjoyed this very much, Sebastian. Let's do it again. Hopefully, sometime in the future. Why not? <laughs>